And uh, joining us now is Professor Serhi Plaki of Harvard University. He's a, prof he's a professor of uh, Ukrainian history and a director of the Ukrainian Research Institute. Professor, how are you? It's great to have you. Professor, are you there? Yes, yes, okay, I am. Okay, great. Okay, I am. there you are. I, I don't, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be on your program. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thanks uh, for coming our, on. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. So, uh, Professor, we just wanted to start with, um, we wanted to have someone on who, who had a, a handle of the situation going on over there, because what, what it seems like with a lot of these uprisings and protests, there's, there's so much misinformation out there. And I feel like especially here in the West, uh, in America, uh, especially actually, we just don't have a handle of what's going on in Ukraine, in the Ukraine, in that in that entire area, really. But in in the Ukraine, so we want to just mm -hmm. start out with um, with what exactly are the protests about, and um, and if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, why they started, uh, what the background is there, uh, what's going on with uh, you, you just go ahead with uh, with with that to start us off. Right, right, right. Well, uh, again, uh, you and your readers and listeners are not not uh, alone in terms of having difficulties figuring out what is going on, because situation is evolving. The nature of the protest is is changing and evolving as well. So it all started as an initiative of a number of journalists immediately after Ukraine. Ukrainian government refused to sign the uh, association agreement with European Union, so it was in late November. Before that, for close to one year, the government was preparing to sign this association. So that was part of the official policy that was supported by the majority of Ukrainian population. And then, uh, uh, literally overnight, the position was changed. And uh, people, people went to the streets, and particularly in the capital of Ukraine, city of Kiev. And the events that, that are called today Maidan started exactly around that time, with very few people coming, uh, coming to the uh, Kiev downtown. But what we see today and the pictures that we get in, in media, on TV, and so on and so forth, the protests that started as non-violent, pro-European protest, not a quite different characteristics. First of all, uh, it's, uh, now it's not uh, just about association agreement, not just about uh, uh, orientation of Ukrainian foreign policy. Sometimes the current Maidan, and Maidan in Ukraine means square, so it's protests on the, on the main square of Square of Independence in the uh, capital of Ukraine. So now it's called not the Euromaidan more often and often, but, but the Maidan of Dignity, so the protest of dignity. And this is basically a broad coalition of all sorts of forces from um, liberals and leftists to nationalists, uh, which is supported by a good part of Ukrainian population that is fed up with inefficiency of the government, with the corruption, and then with the violence that the government uh, uh, is mm, showed more than once that they are prepared to unleash against against uh, its own population. There were up and downs in those protests, and at the moment when it looked like that people were prepared to leave the the uh, mm, squares and streets of Kiev, then there would be some kind of uh, uh, absolutely inexplicable demonstration of strength and violence on the mm -hmm. part of of the government. So trying to disperse students on November 30th, that's something that gave the Maidan that was pro-European a very, a very different very different mission and, and very different kind of sounding altogether. And then on January 22nd, that was uh, the day that ironically in Ukraine is officially the holiday day of national unity. Mm -hmm. The government again in, uh, unleashed uh, uh, its, its riot police against the protesters. So what started uh, as, as an absolutely peaceful protest, like the protests in Ukraine nine years ago, in 2004. Now it's becoming more and more violent. And again, the, the 
people who provoked that are the government. But again, the, the protesters are forced now to respond with, with some kind of force as well. So, so what you're saying is, because I think this is an important distinction here that you just made, was that the, the, the protest isn't so much anymore, at least, uh, like a pro-European type type uh, movement. It's, it's more of like an anti-government movement now, where because where obviously the outcome is that the protesters are looking for would be different in each scenario. Is, is that correct? Uh, yes, I, I would say that if at the beginning when it all started, uh, what the protesters wanted was the uh, basically the government to sign the agreement, something that the government was promising uh, people for close to one year. Now they want uh, the resignation not just of the government, they want the president to go. And there is one year still until the, the next presidential elections that are scheduled for 2015. Uh, so uh, the the idea of Europe and association with Europe uh, also was closely linked to the to the current uh, kind of a sense of of um, what, what what Maidan and what the protests are about. People were fed up with the corruption, and people thought that signing agreement with European Union would mean bringing European laws and European practices to their country. So they were looking at Europe in certain way in this idealistic terms, but on the other hand, it wasn't moment to join Europe. It was the idea to bring European laws and European values and Europeans, European practices of conducting business to their country. So the two things are linked. So it's, it's the question of emphasis more than the question of, okay, it's, it's a completely different thing now. So uh, joining, uh, just to say again, joining us now is Professor Serhai Plaki. He's a professor of Ukrainian history at Harvard University. And I want to follow up on a couple of uh, points that have been alluded to here, Professor. And I, I, one, I mean, it, it does seem important contextually for Ukraine that we've actually been in some respects down this road before uh, with the, I believe we, we dubbed it the Orange Revolution. And in fact, it was right, also right. President Yanukovych, the same president uh, who was uh, deposed uh, or, or, or uh, stepped down at the time several years ago. And it was also the similar mm -hmm. frame of, of basically a tension between Russia and Europe. Which way uh, will Ukraine go? Um, and I and I think that there's a there's a couple of things that are um, important to 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 kind of maybe disaggregate here. So one, which I'm curious, I'm wondering if this plays a role uh, in the debate. It makes a lot of sense why uh, many Ukrainians would be drawn towards joining the European Union in terms of an upgrade of uh, standards on the environment, uh, uh, greater transparency, and other kind of positive things that the mm -hmm. EU brings. On the other hand, we know that the EU is hollowing itself out uh, through very intense austerity policies at an EU-wide right. level. Uh, and then in conjunction with the fact that Russia still obviously plays a very significant role uh, in Ukraine's economy and can really kind of throw its weight around. So I, I, I guess in that practically there, in this tension, was, was Russia in a certain way, was does Russia in some respects offer a better economic deal, though not a better political and social deal? And was it possible that President Yanukovych was negotiating uh, with the Europeans in an effort to maybe get a better deal from the Russians? What what were the kind mm -hmm. of calculations there? Right, right. Well, uh, the uh, current economic and uh, uh, financial situation uh, in Ukraine, which is basically on the verge of bankruptcy, is, is an important factor in the events that are uh, uh, unfolding now in Kiev. So uh, for a number of reasons, the government mismanaged the economy. And uh, people on the street believe that this is basically because of the chronic kind of capitalism, because the oligarchs uh, which uh, supported the government and were supported by the government were stealing from the, uh, uh, fr from the state and so on and so forth. But the reality is that the current government urgently needed a major, a major um, loan to uh, continue going on for the next year and into the presidential elections of 2015. And European Union was prepared to give some financial support, but not uh, on the level that the Russian side promised 
uh, promised the current government. So the promise is $15 billion. $3 billion uh, were released, and then uh, they would revisit the issue in every, um, every quarter. Mm. Looking, I don't know, on the uh, economic uh, side of the story, but also politically whether the current government is, is towing the Russian line. So what that means in practice? In practice, that means that if the uh, association agreement with European Union would be, signed, uh, would be signed, there would be certainly difficulties for many people in Ukraine because of the austerity measures that would have to be introduced, because that's what EU wants, but also that's what the International Monetary Fund wants. With Russia, it's an immediate relief. Right. But in reality, what is happening, it's like actually continue to provide drugs for a drug addict. So without any reform, without any change, so for how long that can last, at some point you'll have to face, uh, to face the reality. So that's, that's uh, certainly the economic situation and financial situation in Ukraine is an important part of what is going on now. I want taking us back, Professor, what you alluded to in the beginning, what you said in the beginning of the, of the different uh, people making up these protests. You said liberals, leftists, nationalists. Uh, I guess liberals would certainly make sense in uh, being supportive of Europe. Leftists, maybe they're not uh, fans of the austerity, but in many other ways you could see them being supportive of Europe. But when we hear uh, nationalists, I think in the certainly in the American uh, uh, the kind of American view would probably associate nationalists with being more supportive of Russia, uh, maybe more kind of inclined towards a sort of autocratic politics. That could be completely off base, but I think that is some of the kind of assumptions that we would take to it. And I'm just wondering, could you bring us into greater depth about the different factions protesting, the different political stances, and maybe also is there linguistic, regional uh, differences within Ukraine that are driving right, these right. things? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, in terms of the political uh, flags, political banners that are present there, there are three, and there are three opposition uh, parties that are in opposition uh, to the current government in Ukrainian parliament. So the first one, I would call it liberal national, and this is the uh, party that is called Fatherland or Batkivshina. The leader of that party, Yulia Tymoshenko, who maybe is known to, to American um, TV viewers and readers, yes. is now in prison for the, for the last, uh, it seems to me, uh, two years. Uh, and it is led by the former head of the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, now the, the, that party is led by the former head of the Ukrainian parliament, speaker of the Ukrainian parliament, Arseniy Yatsenyuk. So it's more kind of a liberal, liberal national uh, side. Then the second uh, largest group is the group uh, led by the uh, former um, uh, heavyweight champion and professional boxer, uh, Vitaly Klitschko. Yes. And the, the, this, the, this group is called uh, Udar, so the strike, and basically they're trying to capitalize on his popularity in Ukraine and in the world as well. And he is now the highest uh, in, uh, uh, the, in terms of the uh, popularity among the Ukrainian electorate. He is the highest ranking politician at, at this point. In terms of their, uh, of their ideology, it is not clear, but I would say, again, it's somewhere within the liberal spectrum. Then the third group is the party that is called Freedom or Svoboda. And this is the party that has basically made spectacular career in the last three years under the, under the Yanukovych government. This is a nationalist party. And there are serious tensions between liberals and nationalists, but at this point... Uh, what unites both of them is opposition to the to the current government, and it is very interestingly that that the nationalists were also strong supporters of pro European, pro European orientation of Ukraine, yes. which basically is explained partly by the fact that the uh, stronghold of this party is in Western Ukraine. And that brings me to this geographic uh, differences between uh, 
western and eastern part of Ukraine. Western part of Ukraine used to be part of Austria-Hungary, uh, Polish state. Uh, the eastern part of Ukraine uh, used to be for, for uh, centuries to be part of the Russian Russian Empire, and this history matters when it comes to today's politics. So from that point of view, you see a very interesting situation where the nationalists are pro-European and, and they're, they're in alliance with, with liberals. So the, the regional differentiation to a degree explains that for how long that alliance could, could last, it is, it, it is not clear. But again, uh, today's Maidan is, uh, uh, or today's protests, uh, uh, they, they started as pro-European and now they're, they're, they're growing in terms, of, in terms of their demands, in, in terms of what people want from, from this government and uh, potentially from the future government. Uh, speaking speaking of uh, the, the, what makes up the protesters and who's protesting, I just wanted to bring up, um, if, if we could discuss... Uh, the, the photos that have been coming out of some of the, the types of, uh, I guess, tactics that have been being used, it's, it's some of the most creative things I have ever seen in, a, in an uprising, in, a, in an activist protest. It's, it's from, from these slingshots to, to this uh, tactic called an auto maiden. If you could discuss just some of these type of uh, tactics, because I've never seen anything like it, and it's, it's amazing what's uniting these protesters and what they're doing on the ground. Right, right. Uh, one more thing is that uh, of Ukraine is, is, is divided in cultural terms and linguistic terms, but it looks like it doesn't matter on Maidan. So people who are this so-called auto-Maidan are basically culturally Russian and Russian-speaking mostly citizens of, of Kiev. Uh, so, uh, and uh, they, they introduced this really very, very interesting and innovative tactic. So the the strategy of Maidan was that uh, they, they occupied central part of uh, the central square of Kiev and now expanding the, the, the territory of freedom, as they say, to, to neighboring streets. But generally, so there was this revolution going on in the center of Kiev, but the rest of the Kiev lived its normal life. So it was, from that point of view, limited, and the government could, could create some kind of a reservation and say, okay, let, let those people camp there for as long as, as they want. So what Auto Maidan does, there are people who, are, uh, who get into their cars, and normally there would be at least five cars together, maybe more, and then they started with, with uh, basically visiting the courthouses, for example, where the people, the protesters arrested by the government, were put on trial. Or they would go to the um, uh, country residence of the president of Ukraine. That's where he lives, near the city of Kiev. The uh, place is called That's Mizhogorye. Brilliant. That's pretty brilliant. And would, would, would kind of uh, create uh, uh, some kind of blocks there and, and would, uh, would um, picket. Uh, there would be picket lines and would uh, stop traffic and, and so on and so forth. And the same is true for the, for the places where the other main leaders lived, of the current governments, uh, government lives. So bringing this revolution outside, outside of this reservation in the, in the very center of Kiev. And the government, the government of course, didn't, didn't like that. And they're using all sorts of ways to crush not only Maidan, but also Autumn Maidan. And uh, using not only riot police, but also use... Uh, use thugs armed with, with sticks and, and, and basically supported and protected by police. At some point, maybe 10, 10 days ago, they tried to bring these thugs from the provinces to Kiev and create a chaos and basically then uh, have, have an excuse to introduce martial law. And it is interesting that it's exactly those people, the Alta Maidan, stopped that from happening. They, they uh, captured a number of those people, put them on TV. They, they, they confessed that they were doing that for something like 25 or $30 per, per day. That's what the, 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 the ruling party was paying them. Stimulus package. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go uh, ahead. Right. So, so that's, that's the, how the automaidan is, is uh, 
acting, but again, the government is trying to go after these people. They revoke their uh, driver's licenses and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's. Uh, but again, uh, there, there is no lack of of uh, uh, volunteers who would like to join the ranks of Auto Maidan. Professor, I have a final uh, two-part question for you, and I, I just think parenthetically, maybe if uh, if Occupy protesters want to renew themselves, maybe they should go to the suburban estates of uh, of uh, bank CEOs. That might be an interesting <laughs> uh, interesting uh, uh, tactic to take from Ukraine. But at any rate, uh, so this is fascinating, I guess that that and and we've seen these kind of inspiring moments. I, I know it's obviously a very different situation, but in Egypt three years ago. There was a wide political coalition in Tahrir Square that spanned, uh, you know, liberal students, the labor movement, to the Muslim Brotherhood, to Salafis. Obviously, that's come apart for many different uh, reasons, uh, and now Egypt is, in some respects, even arguably in worse shape uh, three years on after Mubarak has left. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I think that the, the question I would have is, and and, and also, and, and 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 to add to it as well, I, I someone I, I recall reading somewhere that someone said the distinction between Ukrainian and Russian politics is that in Russian the the oligarch support is uniformly behind Putin. In Ukraine, there's different oligarchs polling for different political parties, kind of saying, but fundamentally, either way you go, this is very, this is driven by a you know pretty small sort of section of financial interests. I guess my question would be is, with those two things in mind, do you th what do you think if this succeeds and the government is pushed out, how likely is some type of cohesion uh, to remain? Uh, after it's all over, as you've kind of so inspiringly described it uh, so far in the square? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we have this experience of 2004, mm -hmm. when the, as a result of this mass protests, the uh, new government and new president came to power. Uh, the trick was that very soon there appeared this... Uh, um, differences and, 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 and problems in the coalition. So I would imagine the same situation happening, happening again. Uh, but at this point, I guess this is the only, the only way, at least for now, to uh, avoid martial law, yeah. to maintain freedoms that Ukraine enjoyed for the last 20 or 20 uh, 22 years, so it happened to be the most democratic country out of the former Soviet republics, with the exception of the Baltic states, so very different from Russia or Belarus from that point. And, uh, and if the martial law will be introduced, so it will be very much not even Russian, but maybe even Belarusian scenario developing. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the tensions, uh, the crises in the coalition, they're inevitable. But again, the way how the Ukrainian society and the Ukrainian uh, political elite will sort it out in the next year or two would be very different from, from bloodshed on the streets. So from that point of view, uh, yes, I, I foresee problems in the future, but I see even even worst scenario at this point if, if the confrontation continues. Of course. And, and do you really quickly, do you see the cohesion remaining in place through this pivotal period, at least, of resisting martial law and a kind of Belarus option for, for Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Well, again, if, if they will build martial law, then, of course, the, the alliance the, the, the alliance will, will continue. Yes. So, right. so martial <laughs> yeah, law well, would sure. be good for alliance, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but uh, certainly very bad for society. Right. Well, Professor Serhai Plaki of Harvard University, really appreciate your time. And, and uh, obviously... Well, uh, again, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, professors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.